Kids to the News! So yeah, let's jump right into this then. Uh, so just run me through very quickly kind of your guys' backstory. Uh, so you guys had connected on the set of Mallrats. So just tell me a little bit, what were your initial impressions of each other and kind of how that friendship grew? First time I ever met Kevin was after a screening of Clerks at the Toronto International Film Festival. Um, it was at a French restaurant. He ordered pancakes. Um, it, 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 it amused me very much. I was wearing a 902 and 02 shirt and I told him that it, he was on a movie with Mall Rats. And I said, if you ever make a movie about called Mall Rats, you have to cast Sharon Doherty in it. That's literally Shannon our Doherty first Doherty is literally in Mall Rats because of some strange Canadian I met at the Toronto Film Festival after a clerk screening who was so <laughs> arrogant. So Isn't arrogant. that weird? He's so arrogant, mocking me for eating pancakes in a fucking restaurant in Toronto and shit. But he told me, he's like, well, if you're going to do a mall movie, you're got to get Doherty. you got to have Doherty. Doherty. And she, he literally manifested that. Like, you know, it, it was Malcolm. And, and we met it as, like, I wouldn't even say he was a fan. Malcolm was a journalist who was writing for Film Threat at the time. And I was a big Film Threat fan. So instantly I lent him more credibility than I would lend most people and whatnot. And in him, I saw my Canadian twin. I'm a big Canada file. So I liked him because he was like, oh my God, this guy's like me. We're very close in age and stuff. We had similar opinions of movies. Malcolm's more of a cineast than I am. He's got more refined taste than I do and stuff. But we struck up this weird friendship that, you know, Malcolm was talking about like, I'm gonna, I wanna make a movie. You know, I don't wanna just write about movies, I wanna make a movie. And I was like, you should, everybody should make a movie and whatnot. I said, I'll tell you what, I got a deal with Miramax where they agreed to finance uh, two micro budget movies, 40K a piece. Why don't you be one of those movies? And then bam, we made Drawing Flies together. So like, you know, he was there for Mallrats. He came out to do a story for Film Threat. And he was only supposed to be there for two days and he stayed for the whole show. And even in post-production while we were finishing the movie, he lived with us at Jim Jack's house as well. I'm sure Jim Jack's was like, why do I have a fucking Canadian journalist on my couch as well? But I was like, he's part of it. I don't know why, but he's part of it. So Malcolm has been around since the beginning and it's a unique friendship in as much as unlike Jason, it doesn't predate clerks or anything like that. Unlike Walter and Brian or Scott Mosier, like Malcolm came when clerks was already like about to open theatrically a minute before we were about to open theatrically when we played at the Toronto film festival. But his personality uh, has been so magnetic that he has to me been a part of the journey as if he was there from before, you know, I was telling Peter Howell in the Toronto Star before the interview we were just doing, when I had the heart attack, like I came home the next day and Jennifer, my wife was like, what do you need? Like, what is gonna make it better? And I was like, honestly, we need to get Malcolm out here. And Malcolm came out and was with me for the first two weeks after I nearly dropped dead because I didn't wanna feel old. And oddly enough, hanging out with Malcolm, even though he's older than me and he's fucking old as the hills, Malcolm has a very youthful spirit and, and it still maintains to this day. Some of that is youthful antagonism towards artists. So like Malcolm's the kind of guy with very fixed opinions about things like, oh, a fucking Snyder cut, you know, don't get him started. But like <laughs> also like integrity, fierce integrity and, you know, never mind loyalty. Malcolm has been honest with me for years. Like sometimes we fight and don't speak for a long period of time because he's has a, a he has a degree of honesty to him that most people in my life they're not dishonest but you know they're just like how do we soft pedal it to him malcolm has never been afraid to like put things on front street professionally with me and personally so in terms of like picking somebody to do a documentary which i didn't it wasn't me going who will do my life story malcolm was the absolute obvious choice as he pointed out in the last interview we did he had we were at sundance Years ago, you know, I was interviewing people for IMDb and we had a morning off. So I was like, let's go see this Richard Linklater documentary. They made a Richard Linklater documentary a few years ago. And as we were coming out, Malcolm's like, you deserve a damn documentary, not this guy. You deserve one. You know, hey, always, hey, hey. Linklater's oh. in the movie. <laughs> I know that's so why that's what's ironic about it. So <laughs> Malcolm was talking about it even back then. He's like, you know, you've done a lot. And I was like, nah, maybe one day, you know, I haven't done a bunch of stuff, but Malcolm has been around for all of it. 
So he knew that there was a lot of movie to cover. And that was before I had the heart attack. Once I had the heart attack, Malcolm was like, ching we have a third act. So, you know, he was the right guy for the job and, and made a beautiful documentary. Like it's, you know, a huge Kevin Smith fan film. I'm a huge Kevin Smith fan. So as you would imagine, I watched the movie, like one watches pornography over and over again, feeling good about myself. While, you know, we were supposed to be a South by Southwest last year and then the whole world shut down. So nobody got to see this movie for a year, but I did. Be like, I'd have to watch it over and over again and be like, thank God. In a world where I wasn't interacting with the fan base this year, because we were all locked up inside, it was a nice walk down memory lane of the first 25 years or the last 25 years of my career that only somebody like Malcolm could have done, man. I love that. And I got to know, so as someone that is a storyteller, is that hard? Is there an adjustment to letting someone else kind of take the ball and kind of tell your story? Not at all, because it's like their work, their problem. Like, you know, uh, and, and I got to do the things that I can excel at. Like, you know, Malcolm wasn't asking me to do heavy lifting where he's like, I need you to do some pull-ups today. Like that, I wouldn't have been able to do that documentary. Malcolm was like, so what happened after Clerks? And then I could just talk for six hours like about one of my favorite subjects in the world that I know everything about, Kevin Smith. So it was very, very easy for me. And then in terms of like the, will he include this or what will or won't be in the movie? There was never, I never thought about that. Like, you know, I talked for so many hours, who knows what got left out or whatnot. But when I saw what he chose, what stayed in, that what made the bigger impact where I was like, oh my God, these are great choices. He made me sound way smarter than I absolutely did. So I had nothing but trust for him in the process. He also had two collaborators he works with who are brilliant. Bruce is DP, nimble little guy, get in places, get incredible footage, captured moments, not just the interviews, but captured really wonderful moments and stuff, has a fantastic guy. So Malcolm and Bruce were the only two people in the field. Like, it's not like they had to, you know, put a little mic on you and stuff and, and there'd be Bruce over in a corner cucking you out. And then he had Sean at home in, in Canada cutting away, you know, and that's the unenviable task of going through hours of me talking and coming up with what will crystallize the story. But thankfully, Sean is a wonderful editor and also a bit of a fan. He knew my world as well. So he's like, this is what I like to hear Kevin Smith say, this shit I've heard him say in other places. And together they had this brain trust that built this, this uh, beautiful, a little flick that uh, spans my entire life. Like, honestly, my one of my favorite films in the world, definitely my top five, you know, and right, right up there with my clerks, which, you know, gave me everything. This is a movie is about like, that I've had my head down and not really paid much attention to. I've been so busy doing the shit that is nice to kick back, watch a movie where somebody's like, here, this is everything you've done. You probably don't even think about it, do you? And I, to be honest, I, I rarely did. And I'm a huge Kevin Smith fan. Don't get me wrong. I'm always thinking about myself. But Malcolm found a lens to tell a story where there are parts of myself that were illuminated even, even for me. So, you know, it, it was an absolute no brainer and, and easy to trust the guy. Did we butt heads from time to time? Like, yeah, but not over anything where it's like, you know, oh my God, you fucking, you know, you're not doing this right or something like that. There at one point we talked about in another interview when we went into this, you know, we had this discussion about whether or not Harvey Weinstein would be mentioned at all. And Malcolm is like, I've known you your whole life, your whole career. Um, I know how much it guy. He's not really a part of your story. Don't let him taint your life story. And so I was like, you're right. And so we didn't really talk about Harvey. But then when I saw the movie, I was like, it's perfect, except it just does seem weird. We don't reference harvey so maybe we should go back and shoot something where i talk about harvey as well and so there was some friction there because malcolm's like you don't need he said, that. no yeah no, he, no, no. When i say friction we didn't talk for a year because malcolm was like you don't need that and malcolm was passionate about it as a storyteller i read it as me going like it's like it'll cost us nothing like we could do it in my house like what do you what do you don't be lazy but malcolm's thing was it wasn't lazy. malcolm as the storyteller was like you don't have to include that guy in this story He's not a part of the story. Like, yes, he was involved in that company. But you didn't really interact with him and he's not really part of the story. And so for a while, like, you know, there was, we didn't speak. And then eventually like Malcolm was like, you know what? Go ahead. We should put it in there. 
And it's probably good we did. That way nobody comes at the documentary and goes like, well, it's very sweet, but they sure left out the big rat at the center of the story. You know, at least we addressed the big elephant in the room. Right. And I, and I was thinking that as well, like how you would word things is talking to Miramax. You never mentioned the name. And I, I did catch that's on to that. The danger. The danger is it's so easy. I found during the course of making this documentary to tell my life story and leave Harvey's name out of it simply by substituting it with the term Miramax, which to be fair, like through most of my career, we always referred to it as Miramax. But in doing that, like we got away with it. You told the whole story without necessarily referencing Harvey. And so it just felt disingenuous. It felt like, look, this is warts and all. We're honest about everything else. Fucking like we do the heart attack shit. We might as well cop to the fact that like Harvey like is at the root of some of your favorite films. They don't, you never get to see him unless that guy picks up the movie. So they found a way to put it in at the right point where like, it's a feel good documentary. Like, I love all these movies. I remember this, I remember this. And then we stopped to be like, by the way, take a shower because now we have to reference. And that was Sean, Sean Stanley gets the credit because we the movie was done. Like it was lit, me and Kevin had an argument for a long time, it got heavy. Um, and essentially, because I want to, you know, I, I want to maintain it. If the movie doesn't have integrity, what's the fucking point? I understand that I'm a really good friend close to Kevin. So I have to be, you know, the filter. And I, I have to maintain the integrity. That's my job. And I took it very seriously. So much so that me and Kevin fucking like had it out. Um, Kevin wasn't wrong. And I don't think I was wrong. But ultimately, you know, I mean, I was just like, well, let's try it. Let's do what Kevin, like, let's see, do what he's suggesting. And it worked. And thank, and the editor, Sean Stanley, is the one who found the piece. And thank God for the Red State with fucking, uh, come on, y'all, which was the perfect place to put it in. It does. It allows you to, like, address the, the you know, the elephant in the room. And then Michael Parks brings us right back into the story. And from that point forward, you know, that other guy is not even a part of it and stuff. But it was never about, like, you know, Malcolm, I need this for me. Like, for me, it'd be better off not to fucking reference Harvey. But, like, I love the movie so much. I was like, Malcolm, don't leave yourself open. This is the only place that you're vulnerable. Like, if you if we include something about Harvey, this movie's fucking bulletproof. Nobody could ever say it's a fluff job or something like that because we literally fucking addressed the elephant in the room. And to his credit, the, like, the fight was about... Malcolm being like, I disagree. I don't think you owe him anything. I don't think you owe the general public any explanation. You, it's not like you were fucking tied up with the dude. He made your movies, that's it. It's not like you got, like he was at your house or shit like that. So like, you don't need it for the story. And I was like, you're right. We don't need it for the story. But like, I just don't want some critic to be like, wow, they left out the fucking dirty parts and shit like that. Cause there really are no dirty parts of my life sadly harvey would be it you know and i was not involved but he's a guy who went to jail for rape and like did produce movies that we made so it felt like address it and that nobody could attack malcolm as a filmmaker or the film as a whole it makes perfect sense um Me, malcolm I it makes perfect sense <laughs> <laughs> fuck you fuck you this is over this is over one year <laughs> and the fight continues there you go <laughs> there goes the follow-up doc um so the last thing i want to ask then because i know we're short on time the last thing i've got to ask is you've worked with so many of your childhood idols and you've talked about it um and in the film and i mean i love whenever you get to talk about george carlin but the one i want to know is is there any childhood idol anyone that you look up to is there still anyone that you're waiting to work with someone that you can't wait to work with once everything kind of gets back to normal there's always like been, you know, SNL has been a huge influence in my life. I watched the very first episode when it was aired, you know, aired in 75 and I've been watching it ever since. And I've gotten to work with various cast members, Chris Rock, Will Ferrell, like uh, Molly Shannon off the top of my head. Um, Bill Murray, you know, is in the DNA of all of my, my Randall like characters, Randall Brody, Banky, I don't get to those guys without Bill Murray. Um, Bill Murray's performance, not Bill Murray as a human being, I never met him, but Bill Murray in Stripes, Bill Murray 
in uh, Caddyshack, uh, Bill Murray in Meatballs, like, you know, the Canon films, not Canon, the movie studio, but the Bill Murray Canon that made my generation fall in love with him. He was our Bugs Bunny. He was a human version of Bugs Bunny who could say it and get away with it. And so he's in the DNA of all my characters. So periodically, there's always this like, wow, like, wouldn't it be nice to close that loop and work with Bill Murray? But, you know, I, I'm not Wes Anderson, so I don't really have anything Bill, worry, Bill, Murthy, Bill Murray worthy, so to speak. Um, so, I, you know, that, but that's it. That's the only name that I'm like, wow, that'd be great. And then there's also a part of me that's like, I gotten so lucky with <laughs> people that I look up to and them living up to who I thought they were. You know, I would hate to, you know, maybe, maybe Bill ruins that curve. I don't know. Maybe he strengthens that. Curve. But you hear a lot of like, you know, he's tough to get onto a set. You know, you got to dial a number and stuff like that. It's just as easy to appreciate him and his work from a distance. But honestly, I, I have been lucky and I've gotten to interact with a lot of people I've looked up to and stuff. Uh, he's, he's the one that I, you know, I, he's the white. You know, guy. what's really cool about hanging around with a famous person is you get to meet the people that you are your heroes and stuff. Right. I remember like, cause people wanted to meet Kevin, especially like, uh, I remember one of my favorite stories ever was uh, meeting Winona Ryder. Do you remember that? We we're on yeah. the mall rats. We were mall rats casting. We we're on the universal lot. They were making how to make an American quilt. And that was literally, and, and Winona Ryder, I was a huge fan of Soul Asylum. Still am. But I, before you even met Kevin, I was a huge fan of Soul Asylum. And I remember we were leaving the lot and Winona Ryder sent a message that she wanted to meet you. And you, the time you had no interest in meeting, like I remember Madonna wanted to meet you. You had no interest. You just didn't want what? to meet people. And I was like, come on, please. The Madonna thing, the Madonna thing was when we, I went to, to Toronto to hang out with Malcolm. Malcolm, I'd met Malcolm in the uh, to Toronto Film Festival in 94. And he knew I was a big Degrassi fan when we met. I was like, I fucking love Degrassi. You know anything about Degrassi? So he told me at one point, he's just like, Joey Jeremiah, he's got a Christmas party every year. You come up, we're going to that Christmas party. I was like, you fucking serious? Like that, Pat Mastriani, who played uh, Joey Jeremiah in Degrassi, junior high and Degrassi high. That was the celebrity. I was like, I'll fucking travel for that. So I was supposed to go into Maverick and meet with Madonna, some general meeting or something, you know, cause we'd made clerks and it was popular and stuff. But like I said, I can't, I'm going to Toronto to this Degrassi party, man, with, with this guy. Malcolm. So I go up to this Degrassi party, um, Malcolm and his friend, Matt picked me up at the airport. Instantly, Malcolm like nearly breaks his ankle at the airport. <laughs> getting back into the car. And so for the rest of the weekend, Malcolm is literally hobbling around. At one point he grabbed a giant tree branch and he was using that as a tiny Tim crutch. But he was desperate to show me the good time that like, he's like, I brought this guy all the way from New Jersey. He's here in Toronto. He's a superstar of indie film. And now I got a broken wing. So he takes us to this party and we show up and it becomes clear in the first 10 minutes that we were not expected and we were essentially party crashing. And I was like, this guy, he got me to come up here like on a flimsy fucking truth that turned out to not be true at all and stuff. And man, meanwhile, that was the cement of our friendship. Like, you know, that was like some of the best times I ever had. Malcolm's gonna do a documentary after this about another filmmaker, a better filmmaker named Bruce McDonald. And like that day we met Bruce McDonald cause I, I mentioned, I was like, oh, Yummy Fur. Yummy I, Fur. I love Yummy Fur. And, and Bruce McDonald was talking about maybe doing Yummy Fur movie. And Malcolm's like, well, you gotta meet Bruce McDonald. He's the king of the fur. We're gonna go meet him. And so he put me and Bruce McDonald into a room at this little like coffee shop. It didn't work. <laughs> Nothing at all. I was just like, uh, you know, I, luckily I'd seen Highway 66 or whatever the movie he first made. But like, you know, uh, he, uh, he, was, he was like, so, you like yummy fur, eh? And I was like, I do. I hear you're making it as a movie. He's like, yeah, yummy fur. And that was it. Like that was our only point of reference and stuff. And Malcolm, as we left, he was like, well, that was a fucking waste of time as he's hobbling through the streets of Toronto. But I fell in love with him because I was like, this poor fucking kid, man. He's, he's, just, he's just trying to show me a good time in Toronto because he knows that I'm not the guy that's like, take me out and I want to be celebrated. Like I could say no to famous people. I wasn't interested in famous people, but like he had access to a famous person that meant something to me and, or kinda, uh, well, I mean, kind, he kinda had access. You also <laughs> met the kids, you met the kids in the hall that weekend too. 
That's true. To be I fair, totally... we went to Kitchener and we met the kids in the hall backstage, which was equally, equally Awkward. as disappointing. Yes, because they, when he brought me backstage, he was like, there's a guy that made Clerks. And mind you, Clerks had only like come out in New York and LA. You know, it was buzzed about and shit, but it wasn't like a worldwide phenomenon. So we go see the kids in the hall live and he's like, we're going back stage because you're a fucking celebrity you get to meet the kids and i was like I love, the, I love the kids in the hall so he brings me backstage to meet the kids in the hall i don't know who he knew and shit we get into the room and these guys just did a whole show and they were so not like into pressing flesh and shit so we just leaned on the wall and we were like hey and they're like hey and you know they were like who are these people what are they fucking doing here so everything that malcolm set up like kind of like fell apart in this weird wonderful way and it just made me fall in love with them it was incredibly endearing you know even though he was a guy i barely fucking knew that weekend i was like i'm gonna finance your movie because you know look at you look at your bad ankle you need you're willing to whore out your fucking your your canadian betters to fucking get yourself a piece (laughs) very true you know the greatest gift you gave me to finish this off on that trip to go uh went on a rider you know what I, i i don't know if i ever told you this story I got to hear my hand of my father in heaven, the greatest thing ever. I went to the craft service. You went off to talk to an owner writer and I went to the craft service table because that's what you do when you're a big guy. I got the craft service table. I got to hear in my own ears, my Angelou, who was in the film for some reason, asked the crafty guy where the cheese whiz was. And that wizened my Angelou voice was like, what? the cheese whiz <laughs> thank you for that kevin smith like, thank she you may, she may know why the caged bird sings but she does not know where the cheese whiz is were you helpful thank you for that, that gift sir were you helpful were you helpful were you like why it's over here ms angelou no no crafty was on it i just got to witness the blessed event brought a tear to my fucking eye get my to angelou, know me, at- kids if you get to know me i'll introduce you to people like my angelou Asking for cheese whiz. <laughs> I love that. I, I love that SNL callback right there. It's great. Um, <laughs> I know. As young as I look, I still get that reference. You got it. You, got it. you pulled it. Get to know me. Absolutely. Uh, e- <laughs> Listen, this has been great. Um, as you know, as a fan of yours, it's great getting to hear stories that I haven't heard before. So this has been fantastic. Did you see the movie? I I did. I loved it. I loved the movie. You like it? Good. He did a great job. It's such I, a I movie. did, yeah. But listen, I, I, thank- I didn't mean to bring it all down. I'm like, no. so bring it back to me, me, me. No, I get it. And here mm-hmm. I'll I'll hear one more for you, Malcolm. Uh when are we gonna get the Phantom of the Winnipeg doc? Uh we're, we're trying Kevin's in that as well. Kevin was like Kevin is the first Kevin and his wife, Jennifer, who is like a sister to me. Jennifer uh, Kevin's wife is the first person who told me that movie was a good idea. Not even kidding. Like, me and Kevin were in Toronto, and I and I just pitched both Kevin and Jen that movie, and Jen was like, "That's a good idea." And honestly, like Kevin's wife is the one who's like that affirmation is what gave me the seed that actually went and made that movie. And Kevin is in the documentary. Well, we had we had a, a bunch of good screenings. Uh, I mean. COVID just kind of fucked everything for everybody. That movie has kind of had its own life, but we're going to try and get it out there. I'm so proud of that movie as well. It's That's a fun one. I can't wait to see it. I mean, look, I got a Phantom of the Paradise poster hanging in my bathroom, and I think I had a Clerks one over in the other corner right there. One of the, one of the other Songs. greatest ones. Oh. Interviewing Paul Williams. Yeah. And uh, when I interviewed Paul Williams, I had a, a quiet, like we had a moment moment of downtime we're kind of waiting for a lighting setup and i said paul i just wanted to say something like one of my favorite pieces of music ever is uh the the song another fine mess that opens uh the end the burst burt reynolds uh burt reynolds movie do you know the movie the end Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's another fine mess i'm into honey and i just said paul i love that piece of music so much and he fucking sang it to me it was just like, whoa! It was incredible. <laughs> That's so great. Anyway, sorry, sorry to take your time, but no, but no, that's great. I'm glad you like the movie. Exchange interviews. Andrew's a goodie, man. He's friendly. Exchange interview uh, info with him and send him a link to the fucking doc to the Paramount. I'll send him a link. But, uh, Phantom, yeah, I think we're Facebook friends actually, so I can reach oh, really? out to you over there. Just send yeah. me a message. I'll send you a link. 
I can't wait to see it. It's a one off. It was so great to talk to you, man. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Sorry I kept you guys long, but this was a lot of No, fun. it was great. It was a <laughs> privilege. Thank you. Nice meeting you, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks so much, Take Andrew. care.